Um, so my talk is going to be on randomized computation, and we will look into uh, the question whether randomness adds any computational power. We will, f we will first have a look at randomized algorithms. Um, yeah. uh, then look at some notions that help us define uh, randomness more formally, like complexity classes, and then some relationships between complexity classes. Um, we will then look at a problem, uh, polynomial identity testing, uh, which is a problem uh, for which we know a probabilistic uh, polynomial solution, but not a deterministic polynomial solution. Um, and then eventually we will look at random de-randomization and look um, how we could uh, use probabilistic algorithms to obtain efficient deterministic ones. So firstly, let's have a look at randomized algorithms. Uh, the idea is that by giving access to random bits, we can help the program make some uh, arbitrary decisions along its computational path, and thus we can obtain simpler uh, and faster algorithms. So a probabilistic algorithm is very similar to a deterministic one. It has uh, some data input, but apart from that, it also gets some uh, random bits, a random uh, bit input stream. And then the output will be a random variable uh, with a certain probability distribution, which depends on the input random bits. Now, uh, two uh, very important and frequently used types of algorithms are Monte Carlo and Las Vegas. First, uh, let's have a look at Monte Carlo. Um, these algorithms always halt. Uh, and they may output the wrong answer. So let's assume we have a problem that we need to determine um, membership to a certain set. So our algorithm will take a, a candidate and then output yes or no. Yes, if it should be a member of the set, no, if it shouldn't be. Now, uh, how can we reason about the answer? So with Monte Carlo, uh, the answer could be wrong with a certain probability, uh, with a certain error. Um, and what we are interested in is how big this error is and also whether it is one-sided or two-sided. So let's assume we have this algorithm. If we can have uh, an error in, in both yes and no, then it is a two-sided error. If yes is always correct and we can only have an error in the no, then it is a one-sided error. And similarly, we can also have the reverse. So we could have um, an error in yes, uh, and the no may be uh, always correct. Um, Las Vegas uh, algorithms, on the other hand, uh, have an expected runtime that is bounded. Uh, we will see what this actually means. So in fact, the computation uh, could fail to terminate, but the result is always correct. You may ask yourself, how can the expe expected runtime be bounded if the computation may fail to terminate? So this comes from how we build this algorithm. Um, so remember that uh, the one-sided error algorithm um, gave us one, correct, one um, answer that is always correct. So if we, if we have an algorithm A that always outputs a correct yes, but can have an error in no, and an algorithm B which always outputs a correct no, but can have an error with S, then we can obtain from that a Las Vegas algorithm in the following way. At each step, we run A, and then if A outputs yes, then it's definitely correct, so we terminate. Otherwise, we run B, and if B outputs no, it is definitely a no, so we terminate. Otherwise, we run this again. The idea is that we stop at a step if we either obtain yes in A and no in B. Uh, otherwise, we repeat this step again. So we can have the case that this never terminates if A and B, uh, so I, I've just talked about this, so if A always outputs no at every step and B always outputs yes, uh, then it would never terminate. However, the chance of this happening drops exponentially in K, where K is the number of steps, so this is why the expected runtime is bounded. Now back to our main question, uh, does randomness add computational power? In order to reason about uh, randomness, we need to define it formally. So um, let's have a look at the definition of a non-deterministic Turing machine. 
Um, everyone who did uh, 1B before should know about this. Uh, otherwise, you will just you will learn about it this year or when you're doing 1B. So um, I will talk about the informal definition uh, because this is, we only need to have an intuition of what this means. We don't need to talk about uh, um, about it with formal uh, mathematics. So uh, let, so assume we have this tape. Um, this is a special symbol uh, showing the, the left-hand side of the tape. And then in each uh, cell we have a certain symbol, 0, 1, 1, 0, and so on. Uh, we can also have the blank symbol. And uh, the tape is infinite, but uh, we have a finite number of symbols. So from one point on, the, we will only have the blank symbol. We have this tape head, which moves left and right, and is initially in this starting position. And um, this head also writes or reads symbols. And then we also have a state Q. Um, we can then for each pair of state and symbol that is read under the, uh, under the tape head, uh, have multiple actions of the form. Um, so it will be a tuple which gives us the new state, a symbol to write in place of the one that is read, and then a direction to move the tape head in. The important thing to notice here is that we can have multiple actions, um, so it is not deterministic. Uh, we can draw a computational tree here. So each three tuple here is a configuration, which is the string uh, from the beginning of the tape to where our tape head is, and then uh, the string from there on. And the configuration is this tuple, which gives us the state, the first string, and the second string. And then our uh, transition tells us which possible configurations we have from each configuration. And we can draw a computational tree. Uh, computation will be a certain path from here to one of uh, the configurations where the state, uh, where the state is the accepting state. And now let's move on to a probabilistic Turing machine. Um, this is a variant of a non-deterministic Turing machine. So it is not a, it is not a non-deterministic Turing machine because instead of allowing any type of transition here, we um, we use a transition. Uh, we, use, we use a probability distribution for the transition. This is stochastic, which means that on the same input we have uh, different results, but also different runtimes. Uh, let's move on to complexity classes. Um, so there are three main classes here. We have BPP, RP, and ZPP. Um, in fact, BPP contains RP, which contains ZPP. So each of them is a specialization of the previous one. So first, I, let's have a look at the more general one, BPP. So it, it is one of the largest practical complexity classes. So what do we mean by practical? Uh, first of all, it has polynomial time because usually we are looking for, uh, we are looking to resolve problems in polynomial time. And then we can reduce ex the acceptance error until exponentially close to zero. This is very important. So in our definitions, we will usually use a constant um, for the acceptance error. For, so we would say that it will accept with a probability of two over three. But in fact, by running, uh, by running the algorithm multiple times, we can obtain an error as small as 1 over 2 to the 100. And it is still the same class of problems. So a, such an error rate might be acceptable in practice. Um, and it is very simple to obtain. So if we already have an algorithm which is in uh, which is for a problem in BPP, then we can just run it multiple times um, and obtain a much more, uh, a much better one with a much smaller error rate. So we've talked about Monte Carlo algorithms, the one that can have two-sided or one-sided error, and um, each problem in BPP has a Monte Carlo algorithm. Um, this is the formal definition. I will first talk about, um, so assume we have this problem um, again, uh, it could be decided member membership to a certain set. So our uh, machine, if it is in BPP, 
accept um, so if if the input is in so if the input should be a member of the set then the machine will say yes with a probability of over two uh, two over three and if it is not in in the set then it will say no with a probability less than one over three notice that we can have an error both if x is in L or if x is not in L. So this is the two-sided error version. Let's now move on to RP, which is basically just a specialization of VPP with a one-sided error. So again, if um, x is in L, then uh, the probability of accepting it will be, over, uh, will be larger than two over three. If it is not in L, it will never be accepted. That means if that our machine gives us a yes, then it will definitely be correct. So notice how this is just formalizing what we've talked about uh, in Monte Carlo and Las Vegas algorithms. So far, we are just <coughs> talking about Monte Carlo algorithms. Uh, BPP was the two-sided error version, and this is the one-sided error version. Now let's move on to ZPP. Uh, so we've just talked about, about this with Las Vegas algorithms. It recognizes the language with no error. The expected runtime is polynomial. And the worst case, uh, well, in, in the worst case, it, it could actually fail to terminate. Um, again, notice that it is expected runtime that is polynomial. Uh, and I've just explained this with uh, using the two one-sided um, error algorithms and alternating them and then having that probability of actually never finishing the computation if A returns a no uh, at each step and B returns a yes at each step. Okay, now some relationships between these classes. So the first one, RP, uh, uh, union co-RP, uh, is in BPP. This, this just means that both of them are in BPP. Um, then an interesting one is that RP, the intersection of RP and co-RP is in fact ZPP. Um, we, we will have a look at each of these. Uh, by the way, I haven't actually mentioned, so co-RP is the complement of RP. So it is uh, the languages, uh, it, they are the languages which are complements of the languages in RP. Um, this first one is quite simple and it follows from the definitions. So if you recall the definitions for each of these, um, so for RP, we were accept if X is in the language, then we accept it with this probability, otherwise uh, with zero probability. Um, and then with, for co-RP, if X is in the language, we accept it with uh, probability one, so we always accept it. Otherwise, it, the error is smaller than one over three. And just from the definition, you can see it here that um, basically uh, one is bigger than two over three and zero is smaller than one over three. So it is quite simple. Now this is a more interesting one. So what this tells us is that for every Las Vegas algorithm, we can convert it into a Monte Carlo algorithm. Um, but here, of course, we are only talking about polynomial time. So this is a two-way relation. Uh, first, we can prove that RP, the intersection of these two is in ZPP, is equal to ZPP. Um, yeah, so assume we have a language which is in, in the intersection. Uh, and now we want to prove that we can build a ZPP algorithm for that. It is exactly what we've talked about with uh, Las Vegas algorithms. So if, if the language is in the intersection of these two, then we have an algorithm A which always outputs a correct no, a yes, and an algorithm B which always outputs a correct no. Um, so we can build an algorithm in ZPP. The requirements in this algorithm are that it has polynomial runtime and it, that it always co um, outputs uh, a correct output. So the algorithm would be a, will be as follows. We run A, if A is correct, output yes and halt. Run B, if B is correct, output no and halt, otherwise repeat. Uh, we obtain uh, polynomial time by selecting a certain, a certain bound a certain number of steps, and then terminating. Um, 
Yeah, sorry, in fact, um, I, I, I said something that's not quite right there. So we, we don't actually uh, need to limit the number of steps because it will converge. Uh, we don't need to limit it because we said that uh, it may fail to terminate. So, but another version of this would be to build an algorithm which if it doesn't terminate after uh, T steps, we just output a don't know. And then um, here's the, uh, the converse. I will, um, I will skim through this uh, since I think the, the following part is more important. Um, so if we have a ZPP algorithm, we can build one that is in the intersection of the other two um, by limiting the number of steps for which we run it. Um, and uh, we know from Markov's inequality then if we run the algorithm for more than uh, three, t uh, three t steps, uh, then the probability is smaller than one over three that it will not output one of the answers you want. Um, yeah, so RP is in NP. So let's just recall the definition of RP. Uh, they are the languages recognizable by a, pol uh, by a probabilistic Turing machine which runs in polynomial time and accepts with probability at least two over three uh, if X is in L, otherwise it rejects. Um, however, we can give a different definition which is equivalence and which can give us intuition into this relation. So a language L is in RP if it is recognizable by a non-deterministic Turing machine. So imagine the computational tree of the Turing machine. And then uh, for at least uh, two over, uh, so we have a certain fraction, which is two over three, um, and at least that many paths are accepting. So if this is the definition of, the R of a language in RP, then this is a language that is in RP will definitely be in NP because the requirement for the language uh, to be in NP is to have one single uh, accepting path. So that is smaller than the fraction two over three, and therefore RP is in NP. Now the question again, so, so we can now formalize this question and we can reduce this to um, does P equal BPP? So what does this mean? Are there any algorithms that can be solved in polynomial time by a random, uh, by a probabilistic algorithm? Sorry, are there any problems that can be solved in polynomial time by a probabilistic algorithm but not, not by a deterministic one? And another interesting thing is that we have n absolutely no knowledge about the relationship between BPP and NP. So we don't know um, any inclusion in either direction, uh, which means we it is even harder to determine whether P equals BPP. Now let's have a look at this problem, which is polynomial identity testing. Uh, so given a polynomial as an arithmetic circuit, we need to decide whether it is identically zero. Uh, let's see what, a, uh, what an arithmetic circuit means. So an arithmetic circuit is nothing more than an acyclic graph. Uh, we have some sources, which are the variables, and then each non-source node has a certain label, which is an arithmetic operation, and uh, we use this to compute a certain value at the output node. So let's have a look at an example. As you can see, each node here is an arithmetic operation. We will compute the value at, at this node and we put our inputs here, x1 and x2. Uh, zero P will be the language of arithmetic circuits with co which compute the, the identically zero polynomial. The identically zero polynomial is one that outputs zero for every possible uh, set of inputs. Um, so this is called actually polynomial identity testing because testing whether two polynomials are identical is equivalent to computing their difference just by adding another node in the circuit labeled minus um, and checking whether that is zero or not. So the trivial solution would be to expand every possible, um, to, to expand the arithmetic circuit into, mon into monomials a monomial is just um, a sum of products, basically. 
and then we can check if the coefficients cancel out because that is the requirement for uh, polynomial to be identically zero. The problem is that when we expand this um, this uh, circuit, we can obtain exponentially many monomials. Um, for example, here. So we need a better solution for this if you want to obtain polynomial time. Um, we have this lemma, uh, the Schwarz-Zipper lemma. Um, so uh, this says that for a certain polynomial p, um, that which has, a, which has the total degree at most d, and assume we have this set of finite in integers from which we can pick some uh, values for x1, x2, xm, uh, and these values are picked at random with replacement. And then if we evaluate um, the polynomial on, s on, these, on some values picked at random with the replacement from s, then the probability that the, uh, that the output is different than zero will have this lower bound. Um, we can actually have an upper bound on, on, the, th on the degree of the polynomial for a certain uh, size of the arithmetic circuit. This lemma is very important and it is used in um, a lot of problems um, and we will see how to apply it in um, polynomial identity testing. So, um, we choose m numbers from s. Um, yeah, this should be 10 times 2 to the m. Uh, but anyway, um, so, we <coughs> so the algorithm is very simple. We just pick at random m numbers from this set. And then we evaluate the circuit on those numbers. And then if the result is zero, we accept, otherwise we reject. Now, this is very simple, but we need to analyze why, why it gives us the bounds we know, uh, we want on probability. So uh, now, if the circuit will be um, a zero polynomial, then the output will, will always be zero or any input uh, on all runs. So the probability of acceptance will be one. If the circuit is not uh, identically zero, then we have a certain probability, which is bounded by this. This follows from, the probability of acceptance follows from uh, the schwarz lemma. Uh, and it is bounded by d, the degree of the polynomial, which we, which we know it is 2 to the m, because the input has m variables, and um, we've just said that the, that the degree of a polynomial of size um, m, uh, sorry, and we've just said that the degree of the polynomial represented by a uh, uh, circuit of size m uh, is 2 to the m. And we've set the size of s to be this, which conveniently gives us a probability which is more than 1 over 3. Now, um, We've just proven that this, that this language is in CoRP because uh, if we get a no, then it is definitely correct. If we get a yes, then it is, uh, the probability of it being correct is bigger than two over three. Um, so we need to remember that all deterministic algorithms for this problem are exponential which means that this would be an example of a problem for which randomness gives us more power. But um, this doesn't mean that P is not equal to BPP. It just means that we don't know a good algorithm that is deterministic. Um, there, the important thing here is that uh, this lemma gives us very simple al algorithms for so many problems, and it's why randomness is very useful. Uh, we can use some mathematical relations to apply very simple algorithms um, that gives us polynomial solutions, and of, as we've said, they can be, the error can be good enough if we run the algorithm multiple times. Now, um, so uh, as we've seen, randomness can be very useful, uh, but random bits can be a costly resource, and our aim would be to eliminate or at least reduce randomness. 
So we want to obtain deterministic algorithms that would ideally be as efficient as uh, probabilistic ones. Now, we have two types of de-randomization, de algorithmic and complexity theoretic. Uh, the algorithmic one um, takes a problem, studies it, uh, analyzes the way uh, it uses probability, and then applies it specifically to that problem and perhaps, if we are lucky, to a larger class of problems. However, the complexity theoretic derandomization could potentially derandomize any kind of probabilistic algorithm. And this would show us that P equals BVP. So let's have a look at the complexity theoretic view. Um, yeah, so the question would be whether we can uh, de-randomize all polynomial time randomized algorithms to obtain deterministic ones that are still in polynomial time. So does P equal BVB? We could do this by simulating a randomized algorithm. The simplest solution would be that so uh, ju let's just recall that a randomized algorithm takes the data input and then a set of random bits, a stream of random bits. We, can, we could generate all possible uh, streams of random bits if, if their number is bounded by Rn, and then run the algorithm for all of, all of those and count for how many the answer was yes. So the complexity for this is exponential because um, Rn is usually of the order On, or it is polynomial in N, which means that this is not feasible. It just gives us another exponential uh, algorithm that is polynomial, and most likely we are already have one. <coughs> so we need to look at a better way of using de-randomization. So oh, as we've seen, if we have, if we have a look here, uh, what gives us uh, exponential um, complexity is the size of Rn. So if Rn wouldn't be polynomial in N, then we could reduce this complexity. Ideally, we could have um, Rn to be of order log N, and then we would obtain polynomial time. So how could we do this? The idea would be to use a pseudo-random generator, uh, which maps a string of size um, Ln to a string of size Rn. But in order to, um, for this mapping to be useful, we need to satisfy, to satisfy this relation, which basically tells us that if we use Ln instead of Rn, our algorithm is still going to be correct. So now um, we could apply the very same algorithm. Look at all the possible values of um, L and then uh, compute f of f of l. Um, computing f of l will take time t prime of n, and then um, we uh, we perform the algorithm on that, which is t of n, and we have this for all the possible values of l n. And of course, if both t and t prime n are polynomial, this will also be polynomial since L of n will be of uh, order log n. Now, do such a uh, pseudorandom generator exist? Well, it is important that um, <coughs> they preserve uniform distribution of Rn because this was our assumption uh, when we proved that the algorithms were correct. It is also important that computing this, uh, this function, so uh, t prime n will be polynomial time um, so uh, these two scientists, uh, Nissan and uh, Wingerson, have shown that uh, there, there is a candidate solution, but they, it has not yet proven to be correct. So it does use a log, a, an order log and seed, but it, is not, uh, shown, it has not been shown that it preserves this uniform distribution, so that it, that it is in fact a pseudorandom generator. So we have this, uh, this general technique, which is not yet proven to be correct, but there are some specific applications uh, using algorithm analysis. So randomness can definitely be used in some particular applications like MaxCut, 
uh, and there are certain strat strategies. Um, for example, for Max Scott, the strategy is called conditional probabilities. Um, however, knowing any of these strategies does not help us uh, reason about general complexity classes and their relations. It just helps us have some efficient algorithms in practice. So, some conclusions. Um, we've seen that randomness gives us some simpler and more efficient algorithms than their harder deterministic problems. Uh, but of course, we do not know whether these problems couldn't be, it couldn't in fact have more efficient algorithms. Um, and we studied that by de-randomization. BPP is still an open problem, but uh, many people uh, think that in fact B is, uh, that P is equal to BPP because it is conjectured that pseudo-random generators that have those probably uh, that that have those properties that we've discussed uh, do in fact exist. Um, yep. So that's it. <laughs>